as common practice. So that's how you would fuse. You can save a fuse. You might not have a circuit breaker, because circuit breakers are also convenient to turn things on and off. You might have a fuse block that is connected to your distribution panel, which happens all the time, behind the panel. And that fuse block might have circuits that are switched, i.e. if the battery switches off, that panel dies. And so you would have battery to battery switch, actually battery to fuse to battery switch to panel, panel to sub-distribution fuse block, always on but switch, but not individually. And then you might have 12 circuits there with uh, stereo memory, carbon monoxide detector. You might have uh, all these circuits that you're not switching on and off at the panel, but you're switching off at the appliance. And so there you might put the fuse right at the beginning of the circuit, and that fuse is going to work double duty. It's going to protect the line as long as you make sure that the line can handle the fuse that you put in. So you have to choose the right line for it. And it will also act as a one place where you can see all your fuses for all the appliances that are able to be turned on or off at the appliance. In an ideal world, you would probably want to have circuit breakers for everything. It's great. Problem is, do you know how much stuff we have on our boats now compared to what their panels look like? You can't. You just can't. The panel on my boat came when my boat had about probably 12 circuits. I probably, I'm not joking, I probably have my cannon, I have probably about 70 circuits on my boat. 70 circuits. I have those distribution, I have like four of them because I fuse everything. But my panel, I, I mean, I'd have to make a whole new hole. I'd have a half panel, it'd be like an Ocean Alexander 48. You can't fit it. So what I end up doing is I end up turning a lot of appliances on and off at the appliance. But the line and the fuse for the, the appliance is at the start of the circuit, right near the distribution panel. Does that make sense? Yeah? So to recap the video, the first example was a fuse at the beginning of the circuit, which is great. Second example was their fuse, but the fuse was located right beside the appliance, right before the appliance. If you have a short anywhere between the battery and before the fuse, the fuse will never blow because the circuit is simply bypassing that fuse. It doesn't need to go through the appliance. The short circuit bypasses the fuse and or the appliance. And so the fuse is going to stay there and it will never blow. And so that's why it's absolutely critical to have the location of the fuse right. Having a fuse isn't good enough. It's the location of the fuse and making sure that everything past the fuse is sized for that fuse. Is sized. For the fuse. Meaning if you're going to put a gauge, a 15 amp fuse, the wire needs to be at least gauge 14. And that's not even looking at voltage drops. That's just looking at ampacity. Voltage drop is not going to cause you the wire. It's not a safety thing. It's more of a functional thing, right? It's an annoyance because your appliances are going to stop working as soon as you take off the charger or the batteries are at 50%, right? That's where people have intermittent chart plotters. It drives them crazy, right? They're sailing. After two hours, my uh, chart plotter dies. Well, it's because they're running the boat and eventually the electronics are going down and because they have really tiny little wires that are going from the batteries to the chart plotter because initially they had an instrument and then they decided, oh, I bet that my builder in 1972 thought about a chart plotter, the helm, that was 12 inch and I bet the instrument that was wired there was able to wire anything. It's a gauge 18 wire and I've seen it all the time. People have gauge 18 wires for their instrument and they're taking power for their chart plotter radar off of that wire. Right? And, then, and then they complain that their Raymarine or navigation equipment is unreliable and boating is really frustrating because nothing works. Unrelated to that is that they're great electricians. Those two things have nothing to do with one another. Clearly great, really bad electronics. And that's those two things. It sounds crazy, but realistically, I always tell guys in my shop, never ever blame anything else than yourself. Don't look outside. If something doesn't work, don't blame the manufacturer, don't blame the equipment, don't blame anything else. Look at what you did. You're most likely the reason why it's not working. Yeah, it's possible that it's something else, 
But 80%, 90% of the time, it's an installation problem, and you're the problem, not the equipment. The equipment is the last thing that's gonna fail. That's pretty reliable. A person is very unreliable. Equipment, very reliable. So location of the fuse, yes? Okay. And now we got a 15 amp, uh, 15 amp breaker. I don't need to put another fuse just after the breaker. Nope. I only have to put the fuse in line that is recommended by the uh, pump, pump manufacturer. manufacturer and actually stay with the pump. Yeah, correct. Okay. That's right. Because you put gauge 8 wire yeah. on a 15 amp circuit breaker, which some people would say, well, that's crazy. Why do you do that? That's a waste of money. You're like, no, because the pump is 20 feet away or 30 feet away. Oh, Exactly, and I want to be able to use that pump not only when I'm connected to shore power and my voltage is at 13.5 or I'm running my engine, I want to be able to use that pump when my batteries are at 12.2, right? And by the time I leave the battery, go to the panel, go to the circuit breaker, go all the way, and it's running, right? Because an appliance under load is going to have lower voltage. I don't want the pump to burn out because I'm feeding it low voltage and then blame the pump manufacturer for making a bad quality pump, okay? All right, so the other demo that I was showing, three and four, is the concept of where people say, oh, I have a fuse, Jeff. There's a fuse right here. And then I see the rest of the boat, there's no fuses anywhere. Like, look, I have a fuse at the beginning of the circuit. Yes, you have a fuse at the beginning of the circuit for a one-aught or two-aught wire, but the moment that that wire is downsized, if everything else in your boat was one-aught, Sure, perfect. You'd have one fuse for everything. Your appliances might blow, but your wires would be all protected. But you don't, you don't go from one knot to everything. One knot is the size of like my little finger. You're not going one knot to everything. You go one knot to the panel. Then from the panel, you go 10, 12, 8, 16, 18. You're changing wire sizes to save cost and also because of space and weight. And then you're changing wire size. Every time you change wire size, you have to install a new fuse to protect now that smaller segment, right? It's a little bit like, um, I like, it's a little bit like, a little bit like chain and windlass, right? Your, the ability to hold your boat in place is a function of your weak link. I don't care how big your anchor is. If you could be tied to a mountain, you could have on your boat it would be a magical connection point that will never let go. If there's whatever weak point, if there's a shackle between your chain and your chain is kryptonite, I don't know. If the shackle can only hold 2,000 pounds and the rest can hold a million pounds, the weak point is gonna be the point that's gonna break. And with wiring, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter that you had a 150 amp fuse on one out wire, if you drop that gauge of wire to 16 after the panel, the 150 amp fuse is not going to protect a gauge 16 wire. And that's what the number three video in four was showing, is that there was no fuse on four, and the 150 amp fuse didn't protect anything. and never blew, because it could easily handle all the current that was going through the gauge 14 wire. Yeah, and I'll show you, that's the, the right way to do it is this one here. I'll just put, this is the way, and this is common, um, right here. Two sides of the wires, two fuses. A&L fuse, going on one aught, going to a distribution point, going to a fuse, right? And then going all the way to an appliance. And so if you short that, The only fuse that blew was the 15 amp fuse. This fuse right here. That's the only fuse that blew. On this example, video number four, there's no fuse here. And both have a fuse right here. Those fuse never blew on either scenarios. The fuse on scenario four is actually these wires. These, well, not, not here because there's no circuit. Because the circuit goes like this, comes back, right? These two wires here completely melted. All this melted. 
And that's really short. And I cannot tell you how thick that smoke is. It is absolute, I've never seen anything in my life as thick as the smoke from uh, the insulation being melted. It is surreal, absolutely surreal. And I mean, that's a tiny wire. That's a tiny, tiny wire. I mean, 14 gauge, two feet. Your boat has thousands of feet of wire on it. Most runs are 20, 30 foot runs everywhere. 30 foot runs everywhere. 14 gauge is super common. And there's much bigger on your boat. So, fusing, okay? Technical difficulty here. Let me see if I can. Oh, there you go. Any questions while I change the slides here? Yeah, I mean, with the Swiss air plate that uh, had smoke from an electrical problem, and it was discovered that they weren't using the correct wire. Supposedly, there's some wire that it probably costs way too much to use, but there's some wire that doesn't smoke so much. Yeah, there are actually some boats actually build boats with actually. And it is very expensive. A wire that when the wire shorts, the jacket doesn't melt. Yeah. Back to the dive line in the middle, when the uh, narrow wire had a fuse. Yeah. When you switch. You still need another fuse that the... Uh, no, you wouldn't. You, if, if that fuse was the right fuse for the appliance, you wouldn't. Okay. If it was a circuit breaker, 5 amps or 10 amps like we were talking for the water pump and let's say the water pump says I need an 8 amp fuse then you would need a fuse at the beginning of the wire let's say it's a circuit breaker and you would need another one right beside the appliance does that make sense all right so now we're going to get into uh, you know basically more kind of interesting stuff I think yes Yeah, we're going to do that. That's my, the, the after lunch. We're going to do, well, not after break, we're going to do a slide on components and then we're going to talk about wiring colors. Yeah. All right. Everybody feels energized? Okay. These are, now this is the stuff I kind of like because actually we're talking about more design. How do things work? How do you choose the right thing for your boat, right? First thing is, again, remember what I talked about, this is a recurring theme, is another recurring theme that I use all the time when things get hard, is I remind everyone that nothing is ever easy, right? And boating is one of them. And boating is e not easy, like golf. And if it was easy, none of, most of us wouldn't be doing it. And also doing systems on a boat isn't easy. It's hard, but making it hard makes it worthwhile doing. So, the theme is, when you're going to go about choosing things for your boat, unfortunately, like the rest of life, lowest price does not equal best purchase. Because if that was the case, buying a car would be simply going on Kijiji and sorting from low price to high price, and every one of us would start at zero or one dollars. Because there are cars out there for hundred dollars, but they're not worth hundred dollars. And it's the same thing with batteries. When you're going to be searching for batteries, there are batteries built for different applications, and you do not buy a battery strictly based on cost. Because there are deep cycle batteries and starter batteries, they have different price points, but they're built for different purposes. They look the same, but they're different. So don't be tempted by strictly buying things based on price alone, i.e. saying, I have, and we'll talk about the differences, I have a boat and I have a house battery and I've got a choice between a starter battery or a deep cycle battery. The deep cycle battery is 50% more than the starter battery. They both look the same on the outside and you're like, well, why would I pay more for the same? You're not paying more for the same, you're paying more for a deep cycle battery, which is meant to be used for a deep cycle. And if you buy a starter battery, 
you're going to have a lot of problems later on. And we're going to talk about what those problems are, and that could be as extreme as an exploding battery. If you use a starter battery for a deep cycle application, it's quite common that you're going to wear that battery so hard, and it's going to be cycling so hard that the liquids are going to, it happened on another client's boat actually about four weeks ago. We were doing an electrical audit, and he was wondering why his um, battery bank um, was actually not reliable and the voltage was dropping so much. And actually, I was on board that boat. It's never happened to me before. I was on board the boat in the engine room when the battery exploded. Yeah, the wife was there and the owner was there. And uh, it was so crazy. I was in the engine room looking for voltage drop. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. And they were using a starter battery for a deep cycle application. And the battery had worn so much and worked so hard, which it's not meant to be because it's supposed to just start, that the battery had actually, a lot of the electrolyte, electrolyte was gone. The plates had buckled. And it was, they were trying to run appliances, run the inverter and stuff like that. And when they did that, the battery box exploded. There was another box on top that had something that exploded and there was bas battery acid everywhere. And that's because somebody decided to buy a starting battery instead of a deep cycle battery because the price, because $20 a battery might be $40. You're thinking, well, it's $20 I can do something else with. But what you're doing is you're short changing yourself. So that's really what the lesson is for components is make sure you educate yourself in the differences of different things, even though they look alike. Like not all inverters are the same, not all chargers are the same, not all batteries are the same. All these things come with pros and cons. And as an owner, when you decide to do upgrades on your boat or change things or make purchasing decisions, unfortunately, price is not king. It's the price, what you get makes the value. And you have to figure out what you're getting for that price. You, you have to do your homework. All right. so. Batteries, different types, you know, like uh, summer tires, winter tires, and all season tires. So we've got cranking batteries, deep cycle batteries, and dual purpose batteries. So what is a cranking battery? Uh, used to start an engine or run a thruster, right? They're both similar type of applications, short bursts of time, high current. Um, so they give you a lot of current for a very short period of time, right? It's like a sprinter. Think about anybody who sprints, you look at a long distance runner and you look at a sprinter, they're not the same people. They're com they look completely different because they're doing, they're both athletes, but they're both doing a completely different activity. So a deep cycle battery is a marathon runner. A sprinter is a cranking battery. Completely different builds. They look the same, but they're not the same inside. Um, and that's a good point here too is that a engine battery or cranking battery is generally never used from 100% down to 50%. It goes from 100% to 98% and it's recharged right away, right? It's not meant to be discharged because as soon as the engine starts, the alternator started, and as soon as the alternator started, everything in your car or your boat that's connected to that alternator is pretty much running off the alternator, right? Because we're now in a charging voltage. So the battery is going to be quickly recharged. And, the, measure, and, the, and it's, the capacity is not measured in amp hours, but in cranking amps, or cold cranking amps, or marine cranking amps. Right? There's different ratings depending on the temperature the, uh, that they're going to be running the batteries. Super important, you cannot, absolutely not bring a cranking battery low. You should not. In terms of low voltage, it just can't handle the wear and tear you're going to shorten the battery life dramatically. It's about a factor of four. So a cranking battery can be brought down to zero about 10 times. A flooded lead acid battery can do it about 50 times. So you can see this huge difference. So that's why when I was a boy and I was, had my first car and I'd let the radio play outside in the field hanging out with the buddies and you go to start the battery, wouldn't start, then you'd have a boost. And you did that enough times and your car battery would not work, right? I mean, that's what it was. And you'd have to go, oh, well, my battery's useless. And you'd have to go buy another car battery. Because if you leave your car battery go drain itself completely, you can't just bring it back to life and do that over and over again. It, it can only do that about 10 times. Yes? So 
Um, with currently with smart chargers that we're going to talk about later on, there isn't. I mean, it can happen, but that would be a really weird anomaly, very weird anomaly. If they're on the wrong charger settings, you're charging an a, a flooded battery with AGM charge profile, or your external regulator has gone crazy on your alternator. It could happen, but it's most likely, right? Remember going back to one of my other examples. The problem on a boat, it's not that electrical is unreliable, is that people cut corners and blame electrical. That's the issue. Electrical systems are extremely reliable if they're done right. If you cut corners on electrical system, not choose the right components, then they're going to be unreliable and people never blame themselves. They blame things around them. And so batteries being overcharged ex happens extremely rare. And a lifespan of a cranking battery versus... Well, because a crank much longer than deep cycle because the deep cycle battery gets worked a lot harder. Um, you know, a cranking battery, think about how often do you start your engine in your car a day. It's crazy. I mean, you could start 20 times. Every time you stop and start, you park somewhere, you do an errand, go somewhere else, right? I mean, it's at least one errand, but every, every stop is a start, right? You could be 10 times, 15 times a start. A, a starting battery can have on a car, like what is, what is it on a car? How many times do we start a car? Five years, seven years? k and Tire gives these warranties. Way more battery life than you'd ever have from your deep cycle battery. Deep cycle battery, flooded lead acid battery, at 50% depth of discharge, we're talking about 300 cycles. A starter battery that is used properly, which is just for starter, can give you like 10,000 cycles. So your starter battery is not gonna die because you're using it, it's gonna die because you're not charging it. And people don't leave the chargers on, or they're using their starter battery to run their house loads. But how often do we, any of us, wonder if our car won't start? I mean, realistically, like, if you do, you have a problem. I mean, it's not like something we worry about. Like, oh, I wonder if today my car's gonna start. Like, it's, it's pretty rare. But how often should we worry about our deep cycle batteries, though? Now, that's a big one. Yes? Do you, um, like, neutralize your lead acid? No. No. Uh, the question is about equalization. I think that um, equalization, when you think about what the implications are for equalization and what you're doing, for people that are here, people that go offshore, different on flooded lead acid batteries. They're might going to have to because they're using their batteries so much more than the rest of us that they might have to equalize. But when, if you follow the instructions of what equalization actually means, and that you actually have to disconnect all your batteries from any loads, because some loads can't handle 16 volts, that you need to actually, so you're charging at 16 volts, you have to top off, because now every cell is gonna be popping at a crazy rate. Now remember, for me, and this is a personal choice, I love my vision. My eyesight is absolutely critical to my well-being. So now you've got goggles, but I don't know if you've worn those goggles. They're not the best to see a light. So you've got to still get close, right? So you've got your face close. It's not a face mask. It's just goggles. And you've got to look through every single cell. And as this is happening, you're topping off the cells, and you're measuring the specific gravity of each cell. While you're connected to shore power, some way to equalize, or and if not, you've got some external regulars that will do that. And it's smelling rotten batteries right, because it smells like sulfuric acid, like, like rotten eggs. All of that for what? So that your batteries are going to last longer? My flooded lead acid batteries, I bought, lasted nine and a half years. I bought between 100 to 150 days on the hook a, day, a year. I cycle them to 50% all the time. They lasted nine and a half years. Could they have lasted me 12, 13? Probably. Would I do equalization to get that extra two years in light of the, everything I just said? Absolutely not. If you want to equalize, I think the best thing to do is take your batteries, put them in the trunk of your car, bring them to the garage at your home, and equalize them in the garage or have a battery shop equalize. But don't equalize a battery on your boat, in my opinion. 
based on the fact that, yes, it's a benefit. Now, there are some people that have no money, right? A lot of us are going to be like that if you go boating and you're cruising. <laughs> no money. Then you might be tempted. You have lots of time. You have no money and you need to make things last. Okay, sure. But then you're going to make a day out of it, right? Like it's going to be an operation. Like it's not a big deal. For me, I'd rather just have my batteries last a little less long. Maybe they're not going to last 10 years. They're going to last eight. Take them and change the batteries more frequently than go through the hassle of actually equalization. Intense. Yeah, well, it's an experience, but the charge time off the motor is, is reduced. Yeah, because you're, you're removing the sulfation. Yeah, so like, yeah, and the question is, it absolutely, you know what? It's like what, if you, li it's a little bit like a dietitian. A dietitian will tell you what you should eat every day throughout your life. And if we followed their advice, I certainly would be a lot healthier. And I would probably last longer and I have a much longer life. But there's implications of following a dietitian's yeah. rules. And, uh, and I don't think anybody doubts that doing equalization is good. Everyone agrees that if you eat perfect, you're gonna, it's going to be better for you. The question is, are you willing to go through all those steps for equalization? Yeah. And that's the issue. And for people that go offshore, that are cycling their batteries a lot, equalization for them is, first of all, I mean, I want, you gotta feel your day. Like, I was down in Antigua for two weeks on a friend's boat. The cruising life is not completely filled every day with, you know, like if you're used to city living, you're hustling. When you're out there, at one, there's a lot of downtime, <laughs> right? So at one point, you gotta have a list. Like as a type A, I have, like, I, I mean, what am I going to do with myself? Like, I got to do something. I can't look at the sunset forever. And so I'd be like, okay, well, we got to start equalizing. Why? Well, because we haven't done it for a week. <laughs> I got to do something, right? So that might be different if you're actually going offshore and you're using your batteries a lot and you have lots of time and you're willing to have precautions, right? That no loads are connected to the batteries while you're doing that. And that's the other thing, too. You got to do it in the daylight, right? You can't run your lights, your LED lights off of that because the LED lights are going to see 16 volts. Right? Okay? okay. Equalization. <laughs> All right, cranking batteries. So opposite of a cranking battery, remember I told you cranking battery is like your sprinter? Deep cycle battery is your marathon runner, right? Um, so designed to discharge over a long period of time. They're, the capacity is measured in amp hours. Um, and so remember amps with speed? Remember I said amps and speed are the same? So if you do speed times time, you're going back to distance, right? Because speed is implicitly distance over time. So if you multiply time, then you get, again, distance. So you get a quantity, not a rate. So that's why it's amp hour. It's amps time hour because amps is over time, so effectively you're now going back to a unit of quantity, not a rate of flow. So amp hours is, you know, on a boat, I might be using 100 amp hours a day. You know, the range is probably on the most extreme boat, a th extreme, 1,000 amp hours a day, utterly extreme, would be a 24-fold boat that's running 500 amp hours a day, to the most modest boat is running 10 amp hours a day, and then you've got that range. That's the range, 10 to 1,000. After that, you're running off generators. Most of us are going to find ourselves anywhere between 50 to 200. That's most of us, right? Now, people that are, you're thinking of buying a lagoon. I was on the lagoon down in, in Antigua. You know, the people are starting at dishwashers. They're not dishwashers, but washing machines, right? Because washing clothing, after a while, if you have a family on board, it starts getting old. Right? And so that's one of the most desirable options is having small little compact washing machines that you run off of an inverter, right? And the inverter runs off the batteries, right? So now your amp hours, where are you going to get that power? You get it from solar. We'll talk about solar, recharge the batteries. But now your daily amp hour on that boat, as they're adding more and more stuff, is like on a lagoon, 
is about 300 amp hours a day, right? Recharging all the laptops because kids have iPads, they have cameras, they need batteries. You, it all adds up and, and it's not like amp hours are stopping because our desire to have more electronic gadgets on a boat is constantly increasing. And on that boat, every kid had a laptop, the parents had laptops, right? They all have cameras, they're all charging, they're charging their iPhones, they're charging their iPads, so they're constantly recharging from the batteries. And so that unit of measure is in amp hours. And whatever you budget today, don't think it's the end of it. You're probably gonna creep up on your amp hour consumption. So when you buy batteries, you're thinking about amp hours, which is capacity over a 20 hour discharge period. It's called the C20 rating. And there's different ways of recharging, obviously, deep cycle batteries, and we're gonna talk about those different ways. Um, and we'll talk about different types of batteries later on too, between flooded and lead acid and AGM and gel. Okay, there's gonna be some differences there too. And this is really essential. There's a big point, and we're gonna be talking about that too, is that when I'm done with a boat, people think I'm crazy in terms of bank, bank, uh, battery bank capacity. They're like, oh my God, there goes Jeff again. So crazy, why so many batteries? Well, that is also unrelated to, sarcastically, to, oh my God, when Jeff does my batteries, my batteries last me eight years. When I actually used to do it my way, they lasted only a season, right? If you have a battery bank that doesn't cycle below 50%, you'll be able to get 300 cycles. If you, on the other hand, have a battery bank that every time you turn on the charger or worry about recharging your batteries is when the lights get dim, around 10 and a half or 11 volts, your battery bank is gonna last you 50 cycles. So that's one season versus six seasons, right? That's pretty substantial. And the, the reality is that the battery banks don't just fail at the end of the season on your last day when you're coming back at the dock and you're like, oh, they failed, but just before. Right? It could fail in the summer. It could be a season and a half, and now you're in Desolation Sound and your battery's failed. And then what? Then you're somewhere, maybe in Discovery, maybe you're further up in Desolation Sound. Now you got to move. You can't go to Refuge Cove. There's no batteries in Refuge Cove. Now you got to move all the way to Campbell River. Maybe you only had two-week holiday. Now you got to go all the way to Power River, find batteries, install batteries, and then get out again. So failure for batteries is not always like a failure of a car battery in the city where you can just have someone drop in a battery and it's relatively easy. And some boats, the batteries are hard to get to as well. And some boats, over time, things have been built around the batteries. So removing them isn't like a one-hour project. It's an eight-hour project. Because the last time they were removed was a long time ago. And now they're all like buried. So you want to make sure that your batteries are easily accessible. And if they fail, you want to make it easy for yourself. So it's really important with batteries to always, especially with flooded lead acid deep cycle batteries, to not discharge below 50% of capacity. And where the factor of three to four comes in is that we'll talk about that later, but with batteries, the top end of bulk charging stops around 80, 85%. So you're really oscillating between two bookends, which is between 50 and 85, optimistically 85. Over time, that's gonna go down to 75. So you're going from 50 to 85 and over time to 75. So 50 to 75 is a quarter of your overall battery capacity. And that's why when you're actually cruising, you're actually only effectively using about a quarter of your battery capacity. Hence why you need three to four times more battery capacity than you think. Yes? No. No. You need a battery monitor. Absolutely. We'll talk about voltage, when, why. All right, so this is a typical battery, 12 volt. It's, this is a 12 volt battery. There are six volt batteries. There are eight volt batteries, right? There's different batteries. Eight volts because a lot of those boats that have 32 volt, 32 volt battery banks will have four eight volt batteries put in series to make a 32 volt. If you had golf carts, golf carts, you could have two of them in series to make 12, four of them in series to make 24, or some owners will have 12 volts and they'll have two 12 volts in series to make a 24 volt bank. And now I'm seeing owners that are doing, let's say, electric propulsion at 48 volts, and they'll have four 12 volt batteries in series to make uh, a 48 volt bank. 
But with lead acid batteries, this is what you're looking at. Each cell is about 2.1 volts. 2.1 times 12 or times 6 equals 12.6. So that's kind of the nominal voltage of a full battery. And it, it's a little bit higher than that. It can go from 12.6 to about 12.8. So a full battery at rest is about 12.6 to 12.8 volts on a 12 volt system. If it's 24, you double that number. So it'd be 12.6 times 2, which is 25.2, right? To 25.8. That's the range, 25.6. Okay. So why would you choose low uh, flood acid batteries? Well, they're obviously um, they're lowest cost. Uh, the acid is in liquid state. Now be careful; it's extremely corrosive. Over time, especially if you overfill the battery, or it's overcharging because it's, it's aging, right? It has more and more resistance because of sulfation and you haven't equalized. What you're gonna find is there's possibilities of actually the battery leaking out from the vent caps. And make sure that your batteries are contained in a container and they're not just installed in the boat like most of us have. Most boats don't have a container for their batteries. They used to be a container, but they've been compromised. I'd say 80% of us. They were either from the get-go screwed with screws because the battery box didn't come with a manual or simply holes were drilled in the bottom or there was simply never a battery box put in because people weren't worried about something that was going to happen eventually, right? They emit a lot of gassing, so the location there needs to be ventilation and that gassing is um, explosive. They need to be maintained and I don't know if you, the Blue Water did a two years ago a presentation with Nigel uh, I think it was uh, down at close to here. It was at, yeah. And honestly, I completely agree with his perspective on flooded lead acid batteries versus AGM. And I think that for most of us, a flooded lead acid battery is a really bad idea because everyone comes up with a reason why they're not going to do the maintenance at one point. And honestly, your battery does not care. It's not your mom. It doesn't understand. It has no compassion. It doesn't care that you got married, that your daughter got sick, that you lost your job, that you did. Whatever reason that is a legitimate reason for you not to maintain the batteries is simply not good enough. And if you don't maintain the batteries and you don't top off the electrolyte, the battery will die prematurely. And it's gonna be a function of how much the plates have been exposed to air. And it's then gonna go be a domino effect because that portion of the plate that's exposed is going to be more resistive. And every time you try to run current through the battery recharge, it's going to heat up more, which is going to cause the electrolyte to be, need to be topped off more frequently, which means you need to look more frequently. And it just becomes this never ending trying to keep the batteries full in terms of electrolyte. And so most owners, most of us, end up finding a reason for why we can't do one of the cells or two of the cells. Oh, I do most of the batteries, but that cell's a hard cell, so I can't really look at that one, but I pretty much think it's good. Like, I'm pretty certain, and when that cell dies, I don't care that you did, you know, all the other cells, because it's only one weak point that's gonna take your whole bank down. So, what Nigel said, which I completely agree, is that people are buying on price a flood of lead acid battery, and they have a binding contract with that battery for the 300 cycles that I was promising. But that 300 cycles is based on the fact that you will never deplete the batteries below 50%, that you will always have them on a charger, always, whenever, you, as much as possible, and you will always top off the electrolyte. So those are pretty serious conditions. And if you forfeit one of those, the battery life would be much less than what you anticipated. And what Nigel said, which I completely agree, is that the end, a flooded lead acid battery is way more money than any AGM battery, but most people get caught in buying the battery at a low cost up front, making promises to themselves that they won't keep, and unfortunately having to pay the price later on. Self-discharge, about 15%. In practical availability, theoretical, the best you can get about a third. Over time, it's gonna get to a quarter. Okay, so, and that's rate, that's based on the charging. We'll talk about the charge curve later. So if you want 600, if you want 200 amp hours of usable battery capacity, you need a 600 amp hour battery bank. Three times. And that's at the beginning. Over time, it's going to be less than that. 
Um, gel batteries, I'm going to go really quickly because honestly, practically, the only time you're going to hear the word gel is ex it's actually when it's actually misused. Most people, if they have AGM, are going to call it gel because gels came before AGM and gels and AGMs are both seal valve regulated batteries and most people use the word gel interchangeably with AGM. It's extremely rare nowadays to see boat owners that have gel batteries. Extremely rare. They are the best batteries in terms of lead acid batteries before the Firefly, but they are extremely finicky and we almost never use them. They're, they need to be really perfectly dialed in for the charge. And so that means the chargers, the regulators, everything on the boat need to be dialed in for it. And if they're not dialed in, their battery life is like in weeks. They had extremely bad wrap. People would install them and they would be cooked within a month because people wouldn't change the regulators on their alternators. And you don't have to do that with AGM. AGM, the battery is going to be slightly undercharged. It's probably not a coincidence why they probably invented the AGM battery. It's just off by 0.2 volts under. So you don't cook an AGM battery with an internal regulator. But with a gel, it wants 13.6, 13.8, 13.5, depending on the manufacturer. And so what would happen is the batteries would get cooked like weeks. And they're expensive. They're twice the price of a flooded lead acid battery. So that's the reason why they got a bad wrap. Uh, we only do gel when the boat was built for gel. And let's say, for example, Tierra builds their boats with gel. But they do everything amazing. So I, if I was the electrical engineer there, I'd be, well, let's build a boat with the best. And we'd build everything around it. And when we work on those boats, we replace gel with gel. And, and it makes sense because Everything was, from the get-go, built for gel. So the alternators have external regulators, the chargers. Everything is built around that battery. So it works in concert. But if you're changing one piece on your boat, and you're going with flooded, and now you want a new battery, going with gel is a, is a big hassle. That's why people don't do gel. They do AGM. AGM stands for absorbed glass mat batteries. They're about a factor of two of a flooded lead acid battery. So if you buy a golf cart battery for whatever you buy it, 175, this is going to be double than that. Uh, they'll never spill, which is a really big thing I really like. They're sealed, meaning they'll gas, but very limited. They can keep, I think, up to about five atmospheres of pressure inside. Uh, no maintenance required, which is really nice. They barely self-discharge. I mean, these are all great things. Okay, this is, nobody's going here, ah, I don't really know. Oh, and the other thing too, they can actually be discharged deeper than flooded lead acid batteries, meaning AGM batteries, you can bring them down, some of them all the way down to 30% and you'll have 300 cycles. The Firefly can be brought down to 20% and have 1,000 cycles, which is amazing. So way bigger usable battery capacity. So we'll have owners that have, let's say, six Group 31s and we can replace them with four standard AGM or three Fireflies. So you can reduce your battery bank by a factor of two-thirds or half if you go with AGM. And they can charge at uh, fast, higher voltages. They're more robust. I mean, all these things are great. The downside is cost. So up front, you pay twice. But you have one and a half times more usable battery capacity. Right? So again, usable battery capacity matters. So a lot of owners, I have owners that want more battery bank but don't have space. I have owners that want the same battery capacity but less batteries. They might be racers and they really care about weight. Um, all those people are going to be considering AGM as a way to reduce weight or reduce space by going to AGM. Can they put these batteries on their side? Yes. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Absolutely. What are, what are AGM? Oh, there's so many different makes. Um, They're all good? Not if I had owners, I've seen this, by the way, if someone's selling you a battery out of the trunk of their car, <laughs> okay, and it's literally, it looks like it's got vent caps on it that are serviceable and he calls it an AGM battery. It's not an AGM battery. It's a battery that they bought, took the flooded lead acid sticker from, put an AGM sticker on it, and are charging you twice the price they should. And if the weight of the battery is half the weight of another battery, 
you didn't get an amazing battery for half the weight, you bought half a battery for double the price. So I have owners that are so deal conscious, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. I bought an 8D AGM that is serviceable and it's half the weight. And I'm like, whoa, that, that sounds amazing. I want to see that. Oh, and unrelated, the battery really doesn't last. I, I have no idea, but my battery monitor, it's always low voltage. Can you come and look at my electrical system? I think there must be something wrong with my boat. <laughs> like, how are those two things not related? You just bought a battery that is half the weight of a battery, because batteries is lead. This is what you're buying. You're buying lead. So if it's half the weight, it's half the lead. And if you can service an AGM battery, well, then you didn't buy an AGM battery. You bought a deep cycle battery that's serviceable that somebody conned you into buying a sticker, and they put it on top. So um, AGM batteries in terms of quality, um, there's so many, honestly, reputable builders like US Battery, East Pendeca, um, I think there's a next one here, North Star, Discovery. There's anyone that has a normal name that doesn't sound like was invented and is going to last the duration of a summer, mm -hmm. right, is a good AGM battery, okay? Really important. Um, because it's not mentioned on this slide, but I do want to bring it up. Batteries come in all different shapes and sizes. People will say to me, Jeff, I have golf cart flooded. Can I have AGM? You can actually buy an AGM battery in any type of battery size you want. You can buy a Group 24, Group 27, Group 31, 8D, 4D, golf cart, slimline, L16, and the list goes on. These are the most popular marine models. You can buy those in gel, in AGM, or in flooded. And then you can buy them from different manufacturers. So you choose who builds the battery, you choose the size, and you choose what type of lead acid battery do you want. Okay? The other thing too that's really interesting with AGM batteries, and I had another project we did um, that was last week, the owner had four golf cart batteries, and on his boat, he was running the aft thruster off his golf carts. Golf cart batteries are, by their very nature, flooded lead acid golf, flooded lead acid golf carts are only deep cycle. When he would run a thruster off of those batteries, guess what would happen to the voltage? Exactly, it would plummet. Now guess what would happen to his electronics when he's coming at the dock? They would all trip. By the way, if you don't think that's nerve-wracking, if you're using a thruster, that means you're not in perfect control. Okay? That's rule number one. It means things are not so easy. right? It's not like calm. So now you're using a thruster, and the fact that you use a thruster means now that you just lost your location, your depth, your whole electronics are down. And now they're going to come back up, but it's going to take a while. So now you're going in blind. You have no cameras. Maybe you're backing up with cameras. Maybe you've got your depth. Your wind, you don't know where the wind's coming from because you lost it, you had it, but not anymore. So the owner's like, oh my God, what do I do? I said to him, I said, okay, can we add more batteries? We should put a dedicated thruster battery. Can't do it, no space. I said, next, let's swap those golf carts for AGM golf carts. AGM golf carts are good for both deep cycle application and start applications, and they have much higher cold cranking ratings. So a flooded lead acid was like, 380 co-cranking amps, which you should never really look at that value on a flooded deep cycle anyways, but you can find it. The AGM was 750, was double co-cranking. The thruster wanted 14 co-cranking, and so with the battery bank, just one, because six volts, with the four, we were able to get to 1,500 co-cranking amps with four AGM golf carts, and before he was around 700. So that would be another reason to consider AGMs because AGMs can handle their dual purpose. They can handle both a sprinter and a marathon load. Okay? So did you make the match between a cranking AGM and, and flooded lead acid for height? You, you could if, and there's conditions to that, ideally you shouldn't. That's the, the, the easy answer is no. Right? Black and white rules are the easiest things. But the reality is you can, not in one bank. You can never mix two golf cart AGM with two golf cart flooded in one battery bank. That you can never do. But if you have, for example, which is much more common, AGM for house and 
starters are flooded. If you have different chargers, and some of us do, we'll have a charger just for the engine batteries. You might have a, a small 30 amp charger that does you know, port engine, starboard engine, and gen set. You might have all those flooded. And then you have an AGM battery bank that is just on an inverter charger. That would be one way to get around with it. You would just never want an AGM battery charger to recharge a flooded lead acid battery. The other way around wouldn't overcharge it. It would chronically undercharge, which is, it wouldn't die quickly, but it would still die if you undercharge an AGM battery. They'll die over probably two years if you undercharge them. But if you overcharge them, they're going to die much quicker. So you just want to have separation between the two. Yes, Julie? No. There is no such thing as a battery charger that actually charges different battery chemistries on the same charger at the same time. A battery charger actually is not that sophisticated. The charge profile is on line one, and it's important to do whatever you want is your primary bank is beyond battery one, and then everything else is going to be replicated on line two and line three. They don't see each other, but whatever is being done on line one is replicated on line two and three. So it's not like the voltage is like AGM 14.4 line one, gel 13.8, lithium 12.8. It's not like three chargers running three lines. It's what does line one want? Replicate on all other lines, but don't let them see one another. That's the reality with the charger. Yes? I'm running six uh, golf carts. Yeah. Um, bank of four and bank of two. And I, I, I start the engine uh, three cylinder diesel. Am I kill Because I didn't want to put in a regular starter battery because it's a different uh, battery box. Say that again. You, you, you put golf cart batteries on your starter application? Uh, not for flooded. Flooded is flooded. flooded yeah, but there, there's no such. There's no difference between. You you do, okay. But not, if, but not the other way around. You would not. Yeah, AGM to AGM lead acid, to flooded lead acid definitely different. Mm -hmm. With your approach, there would be never a need to ever put a starter battery unless you only had a starter battery on board. Right? Because why would anyone ever put a starter? And well, I'm, just, I'm not damaging my, my batteries by charging the starting engine with that. Uh, well, you kind of are. Okay. Because what you're doing is you're bringing a lower voltage to the starter under load. Right? Because the cold cranking amps of a deep cycle battery is not the same. Like you can have, for example, a Group 31 battery, which is about the same weight as a golf cart battery. Mm -hmm. Mind you, it's 12 volts, but you only need one. That one battery is probably more cold cranking amps than your two golf carts together. So you bought two batteries to do the job of one. So I would say next time it's time to change your batteries, I would recommend that you go back to group 31 battery because you're going to have a better cold cranking amps. And the batteries that they're going to charge, they're both flooded. There's no issue. It's not that I've never ever heard of a, oh, I have a flooded starter battery. The bulk charging is in 14.4. It's 14.4 it's on both of them. And you're not using your starter, ba your starter batteries as not starter batteries. You're only discharging a little bit, and then you're recharging them anyways. Mm -hmm. You just want a battery that can hold the voltage under high cranking amps. And a deep cycle battery doesn't do that. And so the problem that what you would face is that over time, as that battery ages, your starter is going to see lower and lower voltages. Mm -hmm. And how do starters die? Because the manufacturer didn't do a good job? Do we look inside or outside? Exactly. Inside, <laughs> right? So the problem is that that battery over time is not going to be able to sustain those voltages. And then you're going to give 9 volts to the starter. And you probably have an analog gauge maybe for your, now that's, totally bogus, you don't know what it is, it's not a digital, and it's only momentary, but you might see eight and a half, eight, but you don't see it, maybe it's nine on the gauge, and you kind of look at it, and it's parallax, and you're like, oh, maybe it's 10, I hope it's 10, but it's not a digital, because if it's digital, you would know. Most of us don't have a digital gauge on our engine batteries while we're cranking the engine, because on the, and the engine panel comes with generally analog gauges, 
So now you're gonna be going from 10 to nine to eight, and then the motor is gonna, the starter is gonna seize. It's gonna, and then you're gonna, no, absolutely not. Okay. The short answer is no. Okay. No. They certainly don't need as much. Like a starting battery is going to get the bulk in instantly yeah. because it's practically not charged or discharged, mm -hmm. right? It's going to take how long to get to 14.4? Yeah. It's going to get there like instantly. But they still want the same thing. Even if you've got some cross all types. Yeah, because you're talking about an automatic combiner relay. Yes. And I can assure you of that categorically. Black and white. And there's not that many black and whites in the world. This is one of them. 